Hi guys, and welcome to the first design video of this 8-bit computer in Minecraft series. In this video, we'll be looking at the fundamentals of computer architecture. We'll cover what a computer is, how computers relate to the real world, and different kinds of computer processor, as well as data representation. My name's Ed Nussing, and for those of you who are new to my channel, I'm currently a PhD student at the University of Bristol. One of my areas of research is computer architecture, which is exactly what this video is about. We'll also be using some of the software tools the university uses in their first year teaching. Just a quick warning to University of Bristol students, the architecture used in this series is similar to your Hex 8 coursework, but significantly different in some very critical ways and some more subtle ones. Today, I'm going to release three design videos, including this one. The first two will cover the fundamental understanding that we need to be able to design digital circuits. If you're confident you understand things like 2's complement, then you can skip to the third design video, which looks at arithmetic units, the first module of our full processor. In this evening's livestream, we'll be building the arithmetic unit inside Minecraft. So let's start by answering the question, what is a computer processor for? Well, as humans, we use computers to do work that we can't do quickly or easily ourselves. For example, rendering a video by hand would take a lifetime, let alone watching it back. So computers do some form of work, which we normally call processing. But critical to this are inputs and outputs. Without inputs and outputs, a computer is just an inefficient way of generating heat. Inputs allow us to tell the computer some state of the world, some information about what we want it to do. For example, a keyboard is a common input. We use it to type characters into the computer. A microphone is another kind of input, and so is a webcam. Outputs allow us to see the results of the processing the computer did for us. For example, the screen, a printer, or speakers are all kinds of output. But we need a way to represent these inputs and outputs that the computer can understand. What we'd like to do is have a set of symbols which we can interpret to mean different things. This is really the essence of human communication, but crucially, it's also the essence of mathematics. After all, numbers are just symbols. They needn't just be one, two, or three. We can actually supply different interpretations for those numbers. For example, one might represent a duck, two might represent a cow, and three might represent a zebra. If we looked at a set of photos, we could label those photos with numbers based on the animals they contain. So the essence of computing is using numbers to represent information, and then processing those numbers to achieve some new information that we didn't know before. Before we look at some standard data representations, we should also think about what kind of processor we want to build. We could build something very simple which just does one thing, say, adds two numbers together. This would be a special purpose or fixed function processor. There are billions of these around the world, such as network communication processors or video display processors. They do one task very efficiently. But that's not really what we want for this series. In this series, we're looking at general purpose processors, processors that can be reprogrammed to perform any task. Alan Turing and Alonzo Church first tackled the problem of general computation back in the 1930s. Turing came up with the idea of a universal machine, one which had a standard set of instructions, which can be used to describe any other computation. Church tackled the problem from a different angle, but I'll leave Lambda Calculus to a future series. So our general purpose computer is going to have a set of instructions, using which we can describe almost any other computation imaginable. Well, that's a little beyond our reach in Minecraft, so what we're actually going to create is a very capable but much smaller 8-bit computer processor. We'll look later at what our instructions are going to be. Let's go back to data representation. We established that we can assign numbers different meanings, and we can even reuse numbers for multiple meanings. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. First, something simple, a door. At first glance, a door might have just two states, open and closed. We could say open is represented by the number 1, and closed by the number 0. However, doors can have more states than that. They might be locked, revolving, broken, or partway open or closed. So a second version of the door state might look something like this. We have the state of the door, the meaning of that state, and a number to represent it. So for example, we have 
broken, meaning the door can't be used. We might represent that with the number minus one. And we might also have an open distance, which could be the angle in degrees from zero to 359, inclusive, representing the angle with which the door is open. And then we could have a second range from 360 to 719, which we interpret as being the angle which the door is open, but the door is also locked in that position. So for example, if the door was locked, represented by 360, then we could say it's locked closed. Here we can see that we can use ranges of numbers to represent a range of states of the door without having to say what each individual number represents. So now we can describe not just an open or closed door, but also how far open or closed it is and whether it is locked or not. For a more real world example, let's look at colors. Computers represent colors in a number of ways, but the most common is RGB. That's red, green, blue. This is because if you mix red, green, and blue light, you can get most of the colors in the human visible spectrum. So how does a single number represent a color in red, green, blue, RGB? Well, first, we assign a range to each part, zero to 255 each for red, green, and blue, independently. We can see how if we change the red, green, and blue values, we can mix and match them to get any color we like. To get a final number to represent each individual color, we can use a formula to combine the RGB values. So for example, computers often use the red value times 256 squared, plus the G value times 256, plus the B value. For a computer, we need a way to represent numbers using a physical machine. Way back in the 1800s, Charles Babbage invented his analytical engine. This used physical wheels and cogs with decimal numbers inscribed on them at specific angles. However, for modern computers, we rely on electricity. The simplest possible electronic component is a switch. It's on or it's off. What we'd like is a switch which can be turned on or off electronically. Originally, we used valves, which were big, power-hungry, and unreliable. In 1959, the first compact MOSFET transistor was invented by two engineers at Bell Labs, Mohamed Atala and Darwan Khan. A transistor is, at a simple level, a switch that can be controlled electronically. By using the off state to represent a zero and the on state to represent a one, we can use electricity to represent numbers. And by using numbers to represent information, we can thus use circuits to represent information. To represent numbers bigger than one, we have to understand how number systems work. We'll start with decimal. In decimal, we have 10 digits, 0 to 9. If we want to represent the number 10, we write 1, 0. Here, the 1 is in the tens column. If we want 123, we write 1, 2, 3. We can see that which column a digit is in determines how we interpret its value. We can make our columns more generic, by using the column index to calculate the column's value. We do this using powers. For example, the units column is 10 to the power 0, the tens column is 10 to the power 1, and so on. We can use the same trick with different bases. The base is essentially the number of digits we want to use. In decimal, the base is 10. When we just want to use 1s and zeros, we actually have two digits, so our base is 2. And this is what we call binary. Let's look at some examples. First, let's lay out our columns. Now let's try out some numbers in binary and also see what they are in base 10, or decimal. With every binary digit as a zero, our number is zero. With a 1 in the first column, that's 2 to the power 0 times 1, plus the remaining columns of 0, which gives us 1 overall. Now we have 1s in the 8s column and the 1s column, so our value overall in decimal is 9. We can also use more than 10 digits. If we want to look at base 16, known as hexadecimal, then we can use the letters 8f for numbers 10 to 15, respectively. 
Hexadecimal is useful because one hexadecimal digit represents four binary digits. This is because the range of a single hexadecimal digit is exactly the range of four binary digits, 0 to 15. We often call binary digits bits. So far, we've looked at just one interpretation of binary numbers, known as unsigned representation. This is because all the numbers have been positive numbers or zero. In decimal, we're used to putting a minus sign in front of a number to make it negative. However, we need a way to represent that in electronic circuits. We can use a simple trick that again just relies on changing our interpretation of the numbers we're using. If we take our normal number line and shift it down into the negative range, we can now represent some positive numbers and some negative numbers. Our number line is still a valid number line. The numbers are increasing from left to right. We start at minus eight, and then we gradually add one all the way up until minus one. When we go from minus one to zero in decimal, that's fine. In binary, something interesting actually happens. Adding one to one, 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 one results in what we call an overflow. The result should be one, zero, 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 zero. But because we only have four bits, we lose the topmost one. So instead of having five bits, we just use four. And so we end up with zero, 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 zero. Let's see what happens to our column values now. Interesting. Our columns have remained the same, except for the topmost column. We now interpret the topmost column as being a negative value. We can see how this works by trying out some different numbers. As before, all zeros is zero. Also as before, setting the bottommost three bits to a one gives us four plus two plus one, which is seven in decimal. But now, if we set just the topmost bit, that means minus eight. And so minus eight plus zero plus zero plus zero is minus eight overall in decimal. Now if we set all the bits, we have minus eight plus four, giving us minus four, plus two, giving us minus two, plus one, giving us minus one overall. That's minus eight plus four plus two plus one is minus one overall. Okay, so we now know how to represent numbers. But how can we convert a positive number into its negative value? There's an easy trick I'll show you, and you can convince yourself later that it always works. Or does it? See if you can find any numbers for which it doesn't work. The trick is to invert all the bits, in other words, swap the zeros for ones and the ones for zeros, and then add one to the final result. Ah, so we need to know how to add in binary. Fortunately, that's quite easy. It's the same pattern as long arithmetic in decimal. Adding the first column gives us a sum of one and a carry of zero. Adding the second column, we get a sum of zero and a carry of one, because one plus one is two. So in binary, we have to carry the two to the next column. For the third column, we have our carry from the previous column, giving us one overall and a zero carry. For our final column, we sum the zero carry from the previous column plus one plus zero, giving us a sum of one and we ignore the carry from the final column. If we want to subtract, for example, a minus b, we would make b negative and then add. In effect, a plus negative b, or a plus the inversion of b plus one. So we only need to know how to add to also be able to do subtraction. This way of representing negative numbers is called two's complement. The fact that addition and subtraction are so easily implemented is why it is popular in modern computer systems. Other ways of representing numbers exist, such as one's complement, sign magnitude, and densely packed decimal. Okay, so we know how to represent numbers in binary. 
And we know we used binary because that is what electronic circuits can easily represent. So let's look at some circuits, right? Not quite. There's a little more knowledge we need before we can do anything useful in circuits. And that knowledge is Boolean logic, which we'll look at in the next design video.